thank you very much for that, that uh, very generous introduction. Um, as uh, uh, Rosa noted, um, I'm involved in the uh, Polnet Research Group at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, uh, which is a joint uh, collaboration, however, with a group of scholars at the uh, Universitat Aberta. Um, and additionally, um, uh, as a member of, of this research group and, and also a fellow at uh, the University of California, Irvine, uh, I was able to uh, do a survey last November, a post-election survey after uh, the uh, uh, 2008 uh, presidential election in the United States, uh, to get comparative data on a number of these important questions to analyze uh, using national representative samples of both the United States and Spain to see what we can learn both uh, in terms of the individual cases uh, with respect to what's going on in the United States and Spain regarding the use of the internet and levels of political alienation as well as to see what we can learn from the comparison between the two how the internet is being used in both cases and what that can tell us more generally about the impact of the internet on political practices, to what extent the internet shapes political practices, and to what extent uh, the internet is shaped by political practices. Um, I plan this talk uh, to be a, a, you know, generally a uh, discussion about just the United States and Spain. However, given the recent inspiring and fascinating events that are coming out of Iran, I'll make a couple references to those events as well to illustrate a couple of the points. Uh, since I know that uh, this audience is primarily not political scientists, uh, I will probably go into a little bit more depth than I otherwise would in terms of developing some of the concepts that I'll be talking about. Um, I hope that doesn't bore then the political scientists of the room. We'll see. Uh, to begin with, uh, there are some uh, uh, common understandings about the nature of political participation. That is, what does it mean and why do people participate? The first is that political participation is a collective enterprise expressing system inputs in the name of civil society. And there's been a lot of research specifically from people like Robert Putnam that has shown that in, in places where there's a very vibrant civil society, it's a very participatory democracy, and that uh, there's a greater degree of system inputs into, from, from the public into the political process. Uh, he draws theoretically a lot on people like Alexis de Tocqueville, but has also supplemented this with his own studies in both the United States and Italy. He's found that uh, using comparisons both over time and between regions, that there are great differences there in, in the uh, amount of political participation, uh, and at the same time that mirrors differences in the degree to which people are involved in community life, along a host of indicators ranging from uh, the extent to which people participate in uh, organizations associated with the local schools, unions, and his favorite example, bowling leagues. Additionally, uh, a number of scholars have pointed to the importance of having particular resources. This is particularly the work of, of Sidney Verba and his, and his colleagues, uh, uh, you know, Slajman and, and uh, Henry Brady, at, uh, who, who pointed to the importance of having a uh, number of resources, including social status, which include things like age, household income, occupation, having a high level of education, and a variety of, of uh, skills uh, in terms of political knowledge, the ability to communicate well, to write letters, etc. that these all have important, uh, re important relationship to, the, uh, to predicting whether or not somebody is likely to participate or not. Uh, these all correlate then, things like socioeconomic status correlate then strongly with the standing of somebody in, in society uh, as to whether or not they, they're older, they're more confident, uh, they have lived there for a long time, and so indicators such as the length of time lived in, in a neighborhood um, have proven effective in, in predicting whether or not people participate politically, as well as things like household income or having a, a white collar or a managerial or a higher level job versus people who have lower level jobs. And finally, uh, political participation is often described as a matter of opposition or legitimation of the regime or the, the incumbent authorities. That is, you either participate to show that you support the policies and the general structure of the political uh, system, or you participate to express your displeasure with that. This uh, presentation is going to, in varying degrees, uh, challenge all three of these assumptions. But before I get to that, I want to begin, uh, I, w I want to uh, turn next to talking about some of the sources of political alienation. We've just talked a little bit about why it is that people participate. However, there's a significant question as to then, well, if we know why they participate, are there any particular reasons that would disfavor P 
people to participate in other ways. The first of those, we'll look at this in terms of, uh, of, of the demand side. That is, in terms of the using, using the metaphor from, from market politics, that is the, the participants. What changes amongst participants might suggest that there's less participation going on? The first is the decline of civil society, Re recalling that, as Robert Putnam indicated before, the strength of civil society was very important to having a very vibrant civil society. Therefore, if it's declining in important ways, we would expect decreasing uh, 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 output in terms of participation, uh, whether it is volunteering for campaigns, voting, contributing to campaigns, signing petitions, attending protests, all of these things we'd expect declines in. Because civil society organizations serve to recruit members to participate, they also serve as means of transmitting knowledge about what is going on in political events and so forth, and where demonstrations are. They also uh, serve an important function in terms of bonding people to have a sense of a common purpose, even if they're not directly affiliated with a political cause. There's a lot of byproduct learning and byproduct bonding that can occur and, and bridging between various groups that can occur through civil society organizations, which uh, Putnam's research, particularly strong in the United States and Italy, has shown this plays a significant role in, in, in terms of uh, whether or not people participate. A second and, and contrasting thesis is an argument that it's not so much the decline of civil society uh, per se, but that there is a significant change in the value orientations of citizens these days. And hence we see what Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart have invariably referred to as a rise of critical citizens. That is, people who do not see themselves uh, relating to the political system in terms of a mass of people expressing solidarity with a group or a cause, but they see uh, political participation in much more individualized terms. That is, people participate more now in terms of boycotts of things, including uh, in, in the market. They'll boycott a particular product or they'll, boycott, or they'll buy a particular product because they think that it produces good, uh, a good ends. If there was a, uh, a boycott against, or boycott against uh, Nike, for instance, because of the use of sweatshop labor uh, during the 90s. And there also were reports of you know, boycotts, certainly about people buying, for instance, ecological uh, a sensible goods uh, as a way to express their solidarity for that. And a lot of that also undergirded support for uh, things such as uh, buying a Prius or other environmentally sensitive uh, cars in both the United States and Europe. But it expands beyond that. A lot of people, in, when it comes to uh, political participation, participation in, in demonstrations or a particular cause, don't see themselves as necessarily tied to an enduring cause. They don't see themselves as a member of, a, of an organization uh, per se, but they see themselves as motivated by particular events to go out and participate. And one example might, of that might be what we've seen uh, in Iran lately, where lots of people uh, connected via Twitter, of all things, uh, they don't, there's no formal organization, per se, that is leading protests scattered throughout the countries. But lots of people are communicating with each other, and they're incensed about a particular situation. That is what they see as Ahmadinejad stealing an election from them. And so they're motivated to go out and protest regarding this, but there's no ongoing social movement or organization necessarily associated with that that these members are regularly participating in. Therefore, uh, for these critical citizens, Political participation is more of an episodic event. It's often driven by particular interests uh, and their values as individuals. They participate not because they, they feel their sense of, of social solidarity with, a, with an ongoing cause necessarily in, in, with respect to an organization, but they feel that it's important to do so and that it's often something that emanates out of their lifestyle, whether it be a commitment to ideas about human rights or environmental concerns, et cetera. These are things they do because they feel they should as a, as a matter of just the kind of person they are. Alternatively, on the supply side, people have pointed to many changes in the development of politics, that is, at the institutional and organizational level. One of the uh, chief causes that, that have been pointed to by people like uh, Jerry Stoker at the University of Southampton is the growing complexity of, of governance. Uh, and this points to a change in the way we think about politics. The very traditional simple model of politics is that we elect a government and the, the officials in the government that we elect are supposed to pursue various policies that they campaigned on 
And that's how we know we have a democracy functioning. It's, this is known as the electoral chain model of democracy. However, politics is a far more complicated issue than that. The production of public policy, uh, particularly in the United States, although I suspect, uh, and, and people in this room can correct me if I'm wrong, I suspect this is also um, in a lot of ways the case here in Spain as well, uh, that the production of public policy involves a lot of members who are connected through various policy networks. Lots of interest organizations compete in this process of, of policy development in terms of shaping ideas and putting input and in, 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 in the content into uh, the final legislation. There are many actors that are involved in the actual implementation that these, uh, in, these, these inputs into the political process and the policy process also transcend levels of government where there are various uh, policies put into, the, uh, into operation at a national level, but there's uh, many levels of implementation at the local level where much of the content is fleshed out. There was some uh, famous work by Aaron Wadalski in the United States talking about the importance of street level bureaucrats when it came to even things like national welfare policy that really spelled out the terms of whether or not people received help or did not. A lot of it came down to the people at the local government offices that shaped that policy. Uh, additionally, you have things like media framing of, of the agenda, which can influence what things get on the agenda. And so there's a very complex uh, interaction between actors that can happen at all levels of government, below the local level. The local level of government, you have media actors, you have social movement actors, you have interest group actors, you have people organized through more formal or informal policy networks, and you even often have international flows that can play a big role in this. I mean, Iran, once again, is, is a great example of this, whereby there were people across the world developing proxy servers for the individual Twitterers in Iran to get their message out by posting proxy servers and feeding them to people faster than the Iranian government could block them. I mean, if you sat there on, on Sunday afternoon, it was fa a fascinating process to watch this happen as they're developing more things or using uh, uh, distributed denial of service attacks and uh, posting uh, websites to do this against to try to get people to shut down uh, various ministries uh, in, in the Iranian government so they couldn't get their message out. In fact, last night there was a rather interesting one that I saw whereby uh, uh, one Twitter posted, here's our demand uh, to the Iranian government. We'll stop uh, trying to organize denial of service attacks if you give us back our access to cell phones and uh, uh, SMS messaging and stop blocking us on the internet. We'll stop attacking you in your use of the internet, which is fairly fascinating, you know, that you have this very international distributed consortium in that case. Usually it's not so complex, but you can imagine, you know, politics, as Jerry Stoker says, today is a very tough business. And so it's very hard for anybody to get into and to be able to show that they have any demonstrable effect in that. A second example, though, uh, comes from uh, political marketing. That is, uh, politics today is more than just uh, tied to, to various sectors of, of the, the population the way uh, it was in most of Europe, apart from Spain, for various particular reasons, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, politics used to be tied to uh, political parties, for instance, uh, the Social Democrats uh, in, in Germany or the Labor Party were tied to the unions. Uh, then you have various conservative parties, which are often tied to various uh, religious factions within or cleavages within societies. And these had then very organic ties to, to, to the societies. With time, these cleavages have less meaning for the development of politics in those countries. And so politicians and political parties have moved in a lot of ways to market themselves, to brand themselves as a particular type of, of, of politics to be consumed by the public. And that's, uh, according to people like Colin Hay, has led to a lot of disenchantment in the society because it is seen then that uh, these parties are not authentic, that they are, these politicians are merely putting on a show for us to watch. I mean, if you remember the, the, the movie Back to the Future where, where Doc Brown was, was talking about, oh, in 1985, the president is Ronald Reagan. Well, of course, it has to be an actor because you have video cameras everywhere and they're on TV and so forth. Well, that's the idea. They're on TV to put on a show. Uh, but I, I can think of no better uh, person to, to explain this than uh, amateur political analyst and professional rock star, frontman of the, 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 the uh, grunge band Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corrigan, uh, said recently uh, before his, uh, uh, after his, his uh, testimony on, on Capitol Hill, 
a couple months ago. He said, these guys are who they are. They're creatures of politics, and they're really good at it. To me, it's still show business. I don't buy the man of the people stuff because it's just show business. Now, uh, Mr. Corrigan may not uh, know a whole lot about politics, uh, but he certainly, I would say, as, as you know, a professional rock star, knows a lot about show business, and he knows uh, his kind when he sees them. <laughs> And uh, it's you know, very much then uh, putting on a show which leads in general to an authenticity deficit where a lot of people then become disenchanted that what they see is not real. This was one of the things that I would argue Obama uh, was able to avoid in his uh, campaign in 2008 was he was very well exposed in both TV and through the internet, but he somehow managed to maintain that tie of authenticity that he really cared and that he, he, was, he was being straightforward with the people rather than just telling them what they wanted to hear. Now, in terms of uh, the internet and political participation, a lot of people have wondered whether or not uh, the internet could be a new space in which politics is occurring, particularly because it allows the creation of new forms of political organization and new ways in which people can connect. I've already alluded to that somewhat with some of the examples from Iran, but I'll talk about this a little bit more. Traditionally, we've talked about uh, ideas of uh, whether or not the, uh, the impact of the internet on political participation in terms of whether or not it mobilizes people or whether or not it reinforces the same uh, political elites and the same uh, uh, actors who are powerful offline and are, are politically participating offline. Uh, I'm going to argue that I think we need to move beyond the simple dichotomy because it is no longer adequate to explain the way politics is happening on the internet. That is, it may have made some sense in the late 90s and early part of the, the 21st century, but the internet itself, the way the internet is being used has changed in ways that I think these two categories no longer apply. At least that's what I'm going to argue. But first, I'll talk about political reinforcement. This is the idea that those who participate online also are the people who are already active offline. So that is, people who tend to be from higher income uh, areas, uh, people who are better educated. And, in, and indeed, uh, there's a lot of data that shows both the United States and in uh, Spain uh, people, you know, high education is one of the strongest correlations with, in terms of access to, to internet use. And Mark Warshower's evidence shows, you know, very strongly in the United States case that that, that tends to be the tr case as well as in a lot of other countries around the world outside the U.S. Uh, so there's some reason to believe that, you know, at least initially, the internet may just reinforce the, uh, dis the disparities in participation that are already existing offline by giving another tool for people who are already politically active to connect with political parties and, uh, and political authorities and other elites and actors who participate in these policy networks and so forth, thereby leaving those who are poor from lower uh, uh, status uh, occupations and those with less education even further disenfranchised from the political process. A second argument, though, claims that there is a great deal of political mobilization, that the internet uh, is, is connecting uh, particularly younger cohorts, which tend to be democratic dropouts, with the political system in new ways. And I mentioned, well, education seems to be one of the strongest uh, predictors of, of, uh, of, of internet access and internet use. As time goes on where internet access is getting cheaper, we find that the young people are using this in larger numbers than they are participating offline, which suggests that it may be then a new, a new venue for people to connect in different ways. This is not to say that you know, necessarily if they're uh, uh, sending out political messages on, on Twitter, this necessarily means the same thing for the political system as if they actually went out and voted. I mean, obviously, these different actions will have different consequences for the political system. However, this points to the importance to recognize the expansion of participatory repertoires online. That is, the internet creates a variety of new ways in which people can participate, whether it is forwarding emails or creating uh, uh, various groups on social networking sites associated with very political uh, various political causes, raising awareness about issues, or trying to bring uh, uh, their friends, uh, recruit their friends directly to participate in a cause. Or, you know, the, of course, the example in Iran, whereby people are uh, directly taking action by doing things like petitioning Twitter to delay uh, its routine maintenance and to a point in the middle of the night in Iran where it would least affect the people trying to mobilize others on the ground. 
I mean, when you're talking about a tool that enables certain political activities to exist that couldn't otherwise exist, categories of mobilization and reinforcement really do not capture what is going on because this is the political space. This is the space in which uh, political action is taking place. And it's not political action as we, as we necessarily traditionally conceive of it. It doesn't fit in neatly to the categories of, of contacting an official or uh, in terms of, of donating to a cause or signing a petition. These are people that are making and organizing politics via the communicative linkages that an information technology like the internet or even you know, mobile technologies such as, as SMS uh, messages or the use of Twitter via mobile phones. A number of people in Iran were, to the extent they could get away with it, using uh, mobile phones in order to transmit information about particular places where uh, government troops were cracking down and, and attacking protesters. So they knew where to go to either avoid that or go there and take photos of it and then transmit that out using their mobile phones. So it's, we're talking about a very wide expansion of political activity that doesn't fit into traditional categories of political participation as they've been defined within political science nor does it fit into traditional categories in which we've come to explain the role of the internet in terms of its impact on political participation. Now, it's often been, been thought that uh, people who do not participate are just simply not interested in politics, that is, or that, that they don't uh, participate because they feel that traditional avenues have been shut off to them. Hence, the internet may be a promising new space for, for people to participate in various ways. I mean, that was mechanically the case in, in Iran, where they could not go out and demonstrate in certain cases, or they felt their votes were not counted. So they used Twitter and Facebook and other venues to express their displeasure about this and try to get change to occur. But all these uh, come back to uh, reflecting a lack of political support either for the specific policies or for the structure of the political system as a whole. And I'm going to explore this using uh, the categories that were developed by, uh, by my current advisor, David Easton, back in the 1960s of political and diffuse support. Uh, specific and diffuse support, sorry. Specific support refers to the general attitude and agreement with the perceived decisions, policies, actions, utterances, or the general style of the authorities in power. So this includes things like whether or not people agree with the policies that are being passed uh, by a particular government or not. Uh, they also refer to the way in which these officials carry out politics. If they do not uh, uh, listen to uh, demands that are placed on them, if they uh, do not listen to various petitions from either d indirectly via the vote or directly via uh, ongoing communications between, uh, act between members of the, of the political community, uh, then it's, it, this would be an example whereby they lack the, uh, specific support for these leaders who are currently in, in power. But diffuse support refers to uh, a broader disenchantment with the political system. It refers to uh, attitudinal agreement that underlies the uh, regime as a whole and the political community as falling off. That is, that people do not believe that the structure as a whole is, is adequate. And the key difference here is that uh, between diffuse and specific support, there's obviously uh, some, somewhat of a relationship, if over time, we find that not only are you know, the specific set of authorities we have elected not responsive to, to our demands, they are not passing policies that are either effective or do what we ask them to do, that over time we might say the voting system is flawed or the party system is flawed. But the few support refers to this general sense, this general reservoir of goodwill for leaders and for uh, the, the political institutions that make up the, the regime. Uh, by which we, we, are, we are said to, to, to believe in generally as opposed to we believe in and we support for particular outputs that we receive by our support. Now, I'm often asked, uh, and, and this was especially true when I proposed uh, to replicate several portions of, of the survey uh, in the United States, they asked me, well, why Spain? I mean, why should we compare the United States with Spain? Why not just study the United States? Uh, and this is often a question that, that people here I know are asked uh, by reviewers when they produce data on Catalan or on Spanish political parties or participation is you know, the question, well, that's interesting about Spain, but why should readers in other parts of the world care? And 
I'm going to argue that I think there are some important uh, uh, differences between the Spanish and American system, which can tell us a lot about both systems individually, as well as we can learn a lot from the comparison that tells us things that, that we didn't otherwise know about the nature of political participation, as well as the impact of the internet on political participation, and additional knowledge about political development and how technologies can play into that. Now, Spain is different was a popular uh, uh, slogan of the tourist agencies, uh, but I think uh, that there's also some important aspects that has in terms of our thinking about politics. There are a number of dimensions along which Spain is different uh, between Spain and the United States. And the first is on the level of internet adoption. Uh, internet adoption here, according to the International Telecom Union, as of uh, fall 2007, was roughly 52% of the, the population versus about 72% in the United States. The United States is more widely spread out. Here, it's a little bit more concentrated. Secondly, uh, the evenness of economic development. The United States, the economic development is more evenly spread out, whereas there are parts of Spain that you'll find that are, are more traditional, um, and they're less economically developed, less industrialized. Uh, which also then may lead to various clusters of higher, uh, high technology, uh, whereas you see less of that clustering in the United States. Uh, that you, you know, that, and that would also then correspond with differences in terms of the extent to which people uh, integrate technology into their work processes and their, their everyday lives, which can have various impacts in terms of how they actually use the Internet. Additionally, the historical experience of political development the United States has always conceived of itself as a democracy. In fact, uh, the American Revolution uh, can best be thought of as a conservative revolution whereby British subjects had thought of themselves as having a revolution to protect the rights they always assumed themselves to have as British subjects. And so there was, there was never this, this period of, of you know, thought of emancipation as, as part of the, the, the political system, never this thought of emancipation uh, as on, 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 in total for the political community to assume rights they know they did not have before. Whereas in Spain, we currently have you know, living generations of people with, with experience, with, with li live, uh, lived experience under Franco's fascist regime. And so there was a period where there was a big political break in which it was people were able to claim rights in mass that were denied to them before. And so that could also produce uh, significant changes or significant differences in terms of how people relate to the political system and their place in it. Finally, uh, there are uh, what uh, have been called uh, cultural differences. Um, and some level, I'll argue that all of these factors can be considered uh, cultural differences at the level of, of different practices of use of technology, different uh, uh, orientations towards uh, the political system and so forth. But cultural differences specifically emanating from uh, the religious backgrounds of these countries. The United States uh, was generally a Protestant country, and there's a very Protestant, uh, um, st strong Protestant element within the culture, whereas uh, if you look at uh, data from, for instance, Ronald Engelhardt's work on the World Values Survey, uh, there, Spain clusters in with a group of countries which refers to as Catholic Europe, and that, that also may translate into different ways with respect to beliefs about the nature of authority and challenging of authority, uh, beliefs about the, the nature of solidarity with, with causes and so forth, and, and the level of individualization. Typically, Protestant cultures are associated with greater individualization, uh, and Catholic cultures are associated with greater uh, uh, communal orientations. Although uh, I think that you know, over time this is changing in a lot of ways, and, and this is obviously some of a gross simplification, this may play uh, a role in terms of our analysis of the data later on. Now, specifically, I think some of these differences would lead us to expect uh, uh, several uh, uh, elements uh, different between the analysis in the two cases. The first is, I would expect there'd be clear differences between online and offline participation in Spain and the United States. Uh, um, that is, uh, that, that in the United States, I, I suspect uh, that, that we should see, uh, given the internet is more generally, uh, it, it's, it's been used by more people, and it's more generally integrated into 
uh, the, the activities of people in the workplace across the United States than it is in Spain, that we'd find that, that there is not as much of a distinction in, between who uses the Internet and who does not in the United States, whereas it might be more the case in Spain. And so you may be picking up some additional demographic dif differences uh, between uh, in, in the Spanish case than you would be in the United States case. A second uh, way in which uh, we might expect to see some differences is that we might see a stronger link between participation and political support in Spain than in, than in the United States. And the reason for that is that um, given the, uh, the experience of political development in the United States that we've always seen ourselves as a democratic society, that uh, it may be the case that uh, uh, we see ourselves as being able to, at any given time, if we so choose, participate or, or take a stand. But uh, we've never had that lived experience of not being able to uh, have a voice in government in the same way that uh, people who lived under Franco's regime lacked that, that, uh, that channel of input. And so one uh, a second hypothesis might be that, that there's this difference in terms of the stronger link between support in Spain than we'd find in the United States uh, regarding political support and the tide of political participation. A third difference that I suspect we might see is a stronger age cohort effect on the relationship between political support and political participation in Spain than we would in the, in the United States. And the reason for this is that according to uh, Engelhardt's work, we're seeing uh, broadly across the globe cohort effects whereby younger generations are more individualized and they conceive of, of, their, of their political participation more along the lives of these, these critical citizens who uh, are, are more willing to, to use new technologies and participate in new ways, see less of, uh, of a tie between themselves and uh, you know, larger uh, sectors of the community as, as a tie of solidarity. And uh, this fits very well with the structure of the internet in terms of people can join a group whenever they feel like it, they can participate and contribute to a conversation whenever they feel like it. Uh, and this this what um, what uh, Andrew Chadwick of Royal Holloway refers to as, as granularity of the internet. That is, that there are these uh, uh, in the individualized streams through which people can participate and interact, but they're not necessarily connected uh, in in a whole holistic, cohesive manner, the way a formal uh, uh, movement organization uh, might be. And so uh, there, there may be, uh, particularly evident in the Spanish case, this emergence as a break culturally, uh, which would indicate a new kind of politics happening along uh, generational lines. Now, some of the research questions then that I'm going to explore, which will address these hypotheses in various ways. The first is, does low specific and few support negatively impact participation? And are there differences between offline and uh, different online forms of participation between the level of support and whether or not people participate. Second, is there evidence that the politically alienated offline are participating online? That is, if the traditional offline uh, avenues to participate are closed off, does that then lead people to shift to new ways to connect online? Uh, or is it true that the politically alienated are just simply politically disinterested and so they aren't participating anywhere? And is there greater or less participatory equality online than offline? That is, are people who otherwise don't participate offline, are they, are they then using the uh, internet as a space to, to participate for various reasons that may be related to their level of political support or may just be related to uh, some, some third independent cause that we have yet to identify? And finally, uh, do we find differences between Spain and the United States in our results? And if so, does this does culture shape uh, the political use of the internet? In terms of the data, the data come from, as I alluded to earlier, two surveys. A Spanish survey conducted in the fall of 2007 uh, by uh, the uh, CIS, Centro de Investigación Sociológica, in uh, Spain. Uh, it was a random probability sample of face-to-face -face interviews with an oversample of 18 to 40-year-olds. Um, and so the data that I'm going to look at is weighted by age to correct for this. Um, that was in order to boost the, uh, the, the subsample of Internet users, because as we pointed out earlier, uh, 
younger cohorts tend to use the internet more so than, than uh, older cohorts in, in uh, Spain. So this was uh, important in order to get uh, a, a large enough sample of, of internet users. In total, there were 3,716 respondents. 50.7% of them were internet users, as I mentioned before. This is pretty close to the independent analysis by the International Telecom Union for the same year, which hit that number at 52% roughly of, uh, of, of Spanish citizens have access to the internet. So that gives us a reason to believe this is a fairly representative sample of, of uh, the population of Spain. Um, in the American case, we uh, ran the survey uh, in order to to pick up on some other additional uh, events. I mean, I guess we did piggyback here on the on the Obama Obama uh, campaign because we ran this uh, survey in the two weeks after the election and uh, included a number of other questions to to analyze uh, uh, the the vote in the United States with respect to internet use, uh, which itself had a bunch of interesting results. I'm not going to report on today. But uh, to do this in the United States, we had a also a random probability uh, population that was, that was selected, but it was a telephone survey for a variety of reasons. It's just too expensive and not practical to do a household face-to-face -face survey. Um, 600 respondents, 74.5% of them were internet users. This also roughly corresponds to the same uh, figures from the, the International Telecom Union, uh, which put in 2007 the number at about 72.5%. So it's not much of a stretch to believe one year later that number was you know, roughly 2% higher in terms of the people that, that had access to the internet. Uh, so we have reason to believe that these are, are fairly good representative uh, uh, surveys of the populations of both countries. Now, in terms of operationalizing uh, specific support, uh, we asked people to rank uh, their, their belief in, various, in the following statements on a scale one to five, where one means they strongly disagree and five means they strongly agree with each statement. The first statement was, public officials don't care about what people like me think. And this is to get at you know, the specific issue of the responsiveness of the, of the public official, you know, whether or not they actually listen, whether or not the uh, public can see something specifically in response to their attempts to influence officials. Addition, second statement, politics and government are so complicated that a person like me really can't understand what's going on. And this if, uh, attaches to the, the, the part that Easton talked about, the, the style of officials and the way in which politics is conducted that it's, it's very complicated. It also uh, graphs on to uh, what Stoker was talking about with respect to politics just being too complicated for many people to, to participate in, that it's over their heads because there are multiple levels of government and actors inside and outside government and so forth that play you know, an important role in politics. And it's just too much for any individual to feel like they ha can have an, an effect. And so this, once again, is, is something that, that attaches very specifically in terms of the, the outputs that, they, that people feel that they can receive from their interaction with, uh, with an official or, or um, with a political party or any type of, of interaction with the political system. And finally, um, to, to, there's uh, a, a, another dimension of a specific support uh, relates to the statement, politicians always put their own political interests first, which gets at the idea that, that um, th this feeling that, that politicians select policies and they act in particular ways that do not address the specific needs and concerns and interests voiced by, by members of the public, but are operating more in terms of the, you know, Michelle's uh, iron law of oligarchy, that they act to preserve their own status and standing, and that therefore they are unresponsive to, to uh, the interests and demands uh, of, of members of the political system. Now, in terms of operationalizing diffuse support, uh, this gets at more this general sense of, of goodwill in, in this reservoir of trust in the, the uh, institutions and authorities of the political system. So we asked people to rank on a scale of 0 to 10 how much they personally trust each of the following. The first was the major political parties. And, and a lot of people have, uh, may ask, well, political parties, though, are, are made up of the, of the candidates and the politicians and so forth. So maybe that's more along the lines of, of, uh, of specific support than diffuse support. I would argue the contrary. Because when you ask something as general as the political parties, 
usually support for the political parties does not directly translate into a specific output, at least not for general members of, the, of a, a political system. Maybe for people who work with or have specific ties to a political party, that may be true. But um, I don't think that's generally the case. Also, uh, Jack Dennis, uh, of the, uh, who was a, a close colleague of David Easton's, makes the same argument in his own work back in the, the 1960s when analyzing political parties and the role of specific and diffuse support in the, in the American political system. Additionally, we looked at uh, the extent to which people trust their local governments. And finally, the extent to which they trust their federal or national government. And these questions were asked the same in, in both countries. In uh, the United States, uh, we find that these three items on each scale uh, uh, scale together very well in a principal components analysis. Uh, in the, the first uh, dimension of diffuse support, we find you know, trust in the central government, political parties, and the local government all scale together very well with, uh, with a, a coefficient of, of, of 0.82 uh, or higher. Uh, specific support, it's a little bit lower, but they're all in the uh, 0.665 or higher range. And so there's some pretty good evidence that shows, and this is, by the way, a principal components analysis with a very max rotation. Um, if people are interested in the, the details, we can talk a little bit more about what that means um, later on. Uh, but in any event, uh, these two factors alone uh, account for over 60% of the variance in the, in the data, which shows that these two factors are pretty good accounting of the uh, of, of people's value orientations. And it also shows that since they line up on different orthogonal dimensions, that these two uh, sets of values and beliefs operate independently of one another, which gives us, uh, which, which you know, the, the earlier question was raised about empirically at any given time, do these operate differently? And this show, gives us evidence that they operate differently in the American case, as well as we have evidence they operate differently uh, in the Spanish case. But they both line up on those two same dimensions that they do in the American case, which gives us additional reason to believe that these are, uh, uh, are, are reasonably good, uh, solid concepts to use and apply using these three items on each scale to, to operationalize them. And once again, uh, the, the, uh, two, these two factors account for over 60% of the variance in the Spanish sample, which leads us to believe these are very good uh, ways in which to, to uh, categorize the data that we're analyzing. Now, in terms of operationalizing participation, this came up uh, a moment ago. I look at participation in three ways. In terms of offline participation, I look at online participation, which may be considered Web 1.0 or more formalized uh, participation online. And then I look at Web 2.0 participation, which I refer to as commenting on a political blog or a forum. In terms of offline participation, that was defined as whether or not somebody in the last 12 months had signed a petition, gave money to a political cause or a candidate, contacted a politician or a government official, attended a political meeting, whether or not they took part in a demonstration or a protest. Uh, Web 1.0 was signing a petition or contributing to a political campaign. And so these are three very different types of political participation. Uh, some, uh, a couple notes uh, I'll make before I get to the, the data analysis specifically. But uh, one uh, thing to note is that uh, while in both cases, uh, two of the most common forms of offline participation were signing a uh, petition or giving money to a cause, uh, the third uh, highest uh, form of, poli uh, of participation in the Spanish case was protest, which uh, a lot of authors have no noted that Spain has more of a, a protest culture, which may have some of its roots you know, going back to the, the overthrow of uh, the dictatorship uh, uh, in the wake of Franco's death, uh, whereas this was by far the least common uh, form of participation in the last 12 months in the American case, where only 2% of the sample, 12 of the 600 respondents, had indicated that they had actually uh, participated in a protest in the, in the last 12 months, which, uh, you know, fairly significant, remarkable differences, which. Um, will have some, uh, possibly some consequences for the way in which we analyze the data. The other thing I'll note is that in the American case, the most common form of offline participation was direct contacting, uh, which is a very individualized form of participation in contrast to the collective 
form of, of a protest. Uh, if people are upset in the U.S. about something, they're more likely to pick up the phone and call or send an email to or go down to the local office of a politician and say, look, uh, you need to do something about this. We need a stoplight at this intersection or we need uh, somebody to, uh, uh, we, we need more funding for scholarships or whatever it is. People are more willing to directly uh, contact officials in the American case than they are here, which was one of the, the least often. In terms of analyzing the dependent variables, um, the, there are slight differences in the wordings between a couple of them. Uh, in the American uh, case, we had the, the measures were more extensive to get frequency measures as opposed to binary measures, which were used in the uh, Spanish case, uh, with the exception of the Web uh, 2.0, whether you post it in a forum or a uh, blog, uh, a political forum or a political blog, where that was a binary question. In the American case, these were two separate questions using uh, frequency measures. Um, and you can see generally the, the, the level of participation on, on all three scales were fairly low if you look at the medians of, the, of, of each of the, the indexes. Uh, the offline participation, uh, I independently verified that these five items generally fit together. These were all binary items, yes or no. And those were uh, uh, validated using a multi-dimensional scaling analysis, which is not reported in the paper that I passed out beforehand. Uh, just because the paper is already fairly long, but it generally shows that uh, these items tend to scale fairly close to each other, so they're not, uh, it's, the, the results are not driven by uh, solely one type of participation or another. Um, and in the uh, online participation case, these were, uh, uh, it, both, of the, both these measures generally were uh, highly correlated with each other in terms of uh, um, their, their relationship. So we have reason to believe that, that, the me that each of the individual items are uh, generally correspond to a, to a, a single dimension. In terms of analyzing online participation, in the United States, uh, I looked at a number of factors uh, controlling for uh, party identification. Uh, I looked at diffuse support, specific support, uh, whether or not people read political news online, which may be a, a, a basis for becoming politically active, and certainly we'd expect closer ties between online you know, uh, political news and online forms of participation than offline ones, as well as uh, other forms of online interactions, uh, such as uh, uh, you, uh, making a, a commercial transaction like online banking, or buying products or services online, as well as surfing for personal reasons, such as uh, for to get information on a hobby or participate in, a, in a, you know, some sort of social activity. Or uh, there's a question if they just use the internet for no particular reason at all just to pass the time, which uh, I also thought was an important measure of the extent to which uh, this represents a person who puts a lot of their life online, a lot of their life is, is conducted through online activities. Uh, and then we also controlled for age, uh, education, income to get at some of those uh, social status uh, variables, which we talked about earlier were important when considering political participation. And the results. Uh, first of all, we find that uh, there's very little relationship. It's a little bit hard to see uh, given the distance here. Uh, but there's very little relationship uh, between diffuse and specific support in any of the forms of political participation. In fact, the only relationship we see in the American case is a slightly negative relationship between diffuse support and offline participation, which means that people may have, uh, you know, think very poorly of their national, local uh, governments or their, uh, the political parties, but they're still likely to pick up the phone and yell at their, their, uh, their, uh, their council member or their congressperson that uh, they want things changed. And in fact, uh, in America, uh, congressional representatives, the Congress has some of the lowest approval ratings of, of any of the organizations in government. Even you know, uh, last fall, uh, Congress had a lower approval rating than Bush did, and he had some nearly historic lows in terms of approval ratings uh, for a president in the United States. However, consistently, people have a higher approval of their specific member of Congress. And so it may be the case that they're willing to uh, pick up the phone or write a letter and complain to these people because they trust them a little bit more than they trust the organization. Additionally, uh, though we find uh, you know, online news, 
uh, is fairly strongly correlated with, uh, with participation across the board. This may also be a proxy for political interests, certainly people who are willing to spend uh, time online to read the news. Uh, have also uh, read the news, uh, are, are also you know, people are, who are interested in politics and they just read the news because they want to know what's going on. Um, additionally, online commercial transactions, this is interesting because it uh, is positively associated with online uh, participation in terms of signing a petition online or donating online. And here I suspect that might be a proxy for people who feel that the internet transactions, financial transactions, are secure. And if you're willing to put your, your uh, credit card information online to buy a product, say, from Amazon, you feel pretty safe about doing that. Also, if you're donating to BarackObama.com or uh, John McCain's campaign or some other political cause. So I suspect that may be going on there. But you notice, interestingly enough, it does not relate to either offline participation or even Web 2.0 commenting on a, a forum or a blog. Uh, so that's how I read that particular result. In terms of personal surfing, and that, that was for people who uh, uh, use the internet just for hobbies or for you know, no purpose at all, just to pass the time and so forth, we also find that this is related to Web 2.0 participation, but no other, other, other form of participation in the American case, which suggests that Web 2.0 is participation of, by people who spend an incredible amount of time online, and they use it to pursue a lot of different activities. Well, at least apart from online commercial transactions. In Spain, um, we see some differences. Uh, first of all, in contrast to the American case where we found no real relationship between uh, partisan identification and uh, participation, and by the way, in the Spanish case, all the parties were, were uh, there were about 14 different parties on the list. I only include the, the three top ones here uh, in the analysis. Or, or I include them all in the analysis. I only include the top three here in the chart just because it would be too difficult to read all the parties. Uh, but the, the most surprising result it, here in the uh, Spanish case is that the two major parties uh, the Partido Popular and the, the, uh, the, the PSOE, the, the Socialist Party, uh, both are negatively associated with online participation, which shows that their supporters, despite efforts, especially by Partido Popular, to get people involved online, that people identify with those, that party are not people who are engaged online much at all. In fact, they're less likely to be the ones that are contributing online. They are less likely to be the ones signing online petitions, which suggests that these major parties have a long way to go in terms of reaching out to their supporters through the internet. Now, in terms of, in, in terms of, of uh, the American case, if we can go back a second, um, you don't, you, you see um, you know, a slight role uh, with offline participation and, and uh, in being a Democrat, we don't see anything, though, with respect to uh, online participation or Web 2.0 and identification with uh, Democrats, which was a fairly surprising uh, conclusion of, of all this, especially since this survey was done right after uh, the, the, the election in, in 2008. And, you know, that's one thing I'll notice, there's a lot going on which exceed the capacity of one paper uh, of this length, which was pushing 12,000 words. Um, so uh, there are a lot of things that I wanted to use the paper to give kind of a general overview of what's going on. But for publishing purposes, this has to be cut down. And there are stories to be told about the Obama campaign and the role of the internet. Uh, and that's actually a paper I'll be presenting uh, more focused on the American case uh, in uh, Potsdam in uh, this coming September. Uh, but I think then there's also a very significant story to be told about the internet and its use by political parties in Spain. Because clearly when the, the coefficients are so strong and, and clearly that, that uh, they're not using the internet in effective ways, that's an important story to be told given they've devoted a lot of energies to that here. And you know, that's something that, that they, both parties or both the major parties need to learn how to correct if they want to make that an effective means of, of uh, campaigning. And, and we've seen how powerful a tool this can be. They need to learn how to, how to effectively implement it. So to pick up where we left off, um, we notice here some, uh, and mentioned earlier, one of the hypotheses would be there'd be a closer connection between uh, political support and political participation in the Spanish case than in the American case. And I think we find some evidence for that. In terms of uh, offline participation, 
uh, we find that specific support um, is correlated with, with uh, offline uh, participation. And I think that uh, that may be partially driven by, I need to look at the, at the individual correlations between the, the, the specific items, but that may be driven by uh, uh, contacting and uh, signing petitions um, as, a, as a means of you know, people saying, well, I specifically trust uh, you know, this politician or you know, my local elected officials or I specifically uh, you know, trust, or I, I think that I could have an impact in, in, the, in, the, in, in this particular case, that politics is not too complicated, that they aren't going to put their interests ahead of mine. And so that may be an explanation in the, in, uh, the Spanish case why specific support does, uh, is associated with you know, attending uh, public meetings or uh, directly contacting officials. Uh, in the case of online participation, we find uh, general uh, diffuse support is fairly well correlated with online participation. And I suspect that may have to do somewhat with uh, trusting, a you know, general sense of, of attitudinal trust. And a lot of people have used um, more general uh, variables to, of, of do, can people be trusted generally all the time to, to value and found that this is strongly correlated with, with political participation. Um, that may also be, uh, in, well, I know it is strongly correlated also with another variable, online commercial transactions, which also then may be another, you know, more evidence of a proxy. People generally trust things. They generally trust the ability to have influence in uh, an online format, such as signing a petition or contributing a campaign. They also trust the Internet security as a technology to transmit uh, financial data to make contributions online and so forth. So that may be the explanation about what's going on there, but that needs more uh, analysis. However, in the case of Web 2.0, again, like in the American case, we find zero relationship to whether or not people are participating online in terms of commenting on forums or blogs and whether or not uh, they, they, have, you know, uh, uh, they have a lot of support for either the system as a whole or they have a lot of support for uh, the particular uh, incumbent officials and their policies. There's zero relationship between those two, which suggests that there is a dealignment from this form of participation and whether or not people participate, which is, is fascinating because it goes against what we traditionally thought about politics being either an expression, uh, participation being an expression of either uh, support or, or dissatisfaction with the way system is, the system is functioning. In terms of Web 2.0, it has nothing to do with that. And it may have to deal with more of these uh, lifestyle aspects and this individualized form of participation whereby people participate not because of some grandiose identification with an ideology, either to fight against the system or to support it, but because of more personal needs and in more personal reasons. I mean, that I think clearly is the case in, when you, you read the Twitter feeds of people from around the world who are writing to, to Twitterers in, in Iran in that case. And they're motivated, I suspect, a lot more because it is a very appealing uh, human drama that's being played out in, in that form of politics. Um, and it may be the case, you know, maybe not you know, so grandiose a scale uh, in the case of people who are participating in these online forums and chat rooms, but it, they're talking about issues that they care about, whether it's an environmental issue, whether it's a human rights issue, whether it's a local issue about conserving open space around the, around the cities to preserve you know, the, the, the local environment, or those sorts of issues that are more mundane and every day, it may be because they're motivated out of you know, a direct concern. They, they don't want uh, the, their property value to go down, or they want their kids to be safe, or whatever else it is. Uh, but these are things that are, are less attached to these general ideological considerations, which had uh, often been associated with motivators of, of political participation. Um, uninterestingly, we, we find that uh, reading online political news associated with all three forms of, of political participation, and even more so with each form of uh, online uh, in Web 2.0 participation. Um, processing online commercial transaction, likewise associated with online participation in the Spanish case, I think for the same reasons, that this is a proxy for having trust in the ability and the, the security of your, your financial data online. Although, like the American case, this has nothing to do with Web 2.0. Personal surfing uh, is strongly correlated with both the online and Web 2.0 forms of participation. 
uh, in the Spanish case, which I think, uh, and this is a slight difference from the American case, where it's not as strongly correlated and not correlated at all with online participation, which suggests that this may be concentrated amongst younger um, or at least heavy internet using people. Uh, in the Spanish case, and this may uh, uh, represent a, a, either a generation or a category of internauts that are more generally distributed in the American case, but less so in the Spanish case. This may also reflect some of the differences in terms of development, whereby you know, people here, regardless of age, uh, but in certain uh, higher technology areas of Spain, uh, such as Barcelona or Zaragoza or Madrid, there's a lot of people in their, their regular daily activities use technology and the internet and, and mobile phone technology to, to connect and interact um, on a regular basis. And so naturally their politics translate in that form as well. Uh, and so that may be reflected here. Uh, there's less of that tie in the, the American case. Um, so there may be less of this generational or occupational uh, effect going on here, but it's more pronounced in the Spanish case possibly due to some of these developmental differences and the, the evenness of, of, uh, of uh, economic development. Finally, uh, we find uh, the, the uh, similar uh, statistics in the American case regarding offline and online participation, whereby age and education are positively associated with, uh, with, with participation in online and offline um, uh, forums. Uh, which, which gives support for the resource and the, the, the general civic skills uh, models of participation that social status plays a significant role. However, when we get to uh, Web 2.0 participation, that's, age is also strongly correlated, but here we see it as negative. And also, we see, um, to go back a second, we also see that education is, uh, drops out as a, as a predictor when it comes to Web 2.0 participation, which suggests that similar to the American experience, there are a lot of people who are young, have internet access, and they are using uh, uh, Web 2.0 and these new technologies in various uh, ways. Uh, in addition to you know, surfing for various personal reasons, and they are also reading a lot of online political news, etc. A lot of their life is spent online, and this is becoming a very central part of their life. And their politics is appearing there in new ways that aren't related to whether or not they support or oppose the authorities or they, they, they believe in the efficacy of the political institutions. And so these are then, um, I think, you know, important differences with respect to the way people are participating in uh, Spain, as well as the way people are participating online and especially in horizontal forms, such as, as chat rooms and, and blogs. Um, and it would be important to do more uh, a, a, a wider study of Web 2.0 forums to see how generalized this phenomena is uh, so we can make some more robust and general claims about the importance of Web 2.0. But I think we see some important differences in terms of that form of participation, which suggests that there's some new and exciting things that are happening with respect to the expansion of participatory repertoires and places where politics is happening that uh, are important for both uh, political parties, political officials, and more generally, understanding about how the political system functions. So then in terms of conclusions, I think we find that political support and uh, regarding political support and political participation, this relationship is uneven. And in the US, there are either no or even a negative relationship between participation and political support, which suggests that there are some you know, fairly significant cha um, transitions that happen as especially as democracies become even more modern and, and late modern, as people like Ulrich Beck or, or Anthony Giddens would suggest, with respect to their conceptions about political participation and people's role in the political system. That is especially evident in the youngest cohorts, which are thought to be more de-aligned from formal political in, uh, uh, structures, especially if you read the work of, of people like Russ Dalton or Ron Englehart or, or Pippa Norris, whereby it's the youngest cohorts that are more individualized and have more disdain for authority and formal political institutions that may be finding their political home in the internet as they found other political sites more closed off to them and less responsive. Uh, and this may happen even more over time uh, with respect to uh, more generally within Spain, but we at least see that uh, somewhat pronounced with this younger generation of Web 2.0 users in the Spanish case. Uh, secondly, uh, with respect to political mobilization and reinforcement, uh, with respect to Web 1.0, which is still 
uh, more of a formal form of online participation and, and somewhat of a offline or online counterpart to formalized offline uh, participation. Uh, we find somewhat of a mixed picture whereby uh, some of the general uh, demographic categories where, whereby social status plays an important role in terms of political participation offline uh, in the Spanish case. It does also in the online category and, and also in the American case as well. But in terms of Web 2.0, we find that social status in terms of age and education and income are less important, that people use these tools to participate in in both cases, independent of their belief in the uh, in, in trust or their belief in the, the responsiveness of the uh, incumbent authorities within the political system and the responsiveness of the institutions, which indicates there are some significant changes occurring in terms of how people conceive of that participation and the people who participate in that in those forums. So the structure of the online environment could be a very important element uh, that contrasts with the structure, the more formalized structures, as well as the more uh, the structures more geared towards social solidarity and the relationships of civil society organizations offline where about, that lead people to protest or lead people to go to public meetings or to, to contact authorities. Um, Finally, I think we find some evidence for a cultural shaping of the internet. We find some evidence that there are differences between how the major parties relate uh, to, uh, to, to uh, politics and, and the political use of the internet in the United States and in Spain. Part of that was already mentioned in terms of the political culture and the organizational structure within Spain, whereby uh, in uh, Spain it's more of a formalized and bureaucratized process. Uh, somewhat more detached from uh, civil society in various ways, but that is significantly different from the American case, whereby they, each candidate has to generate their own structure, and the Internet may be more useful across the board way in which people interact with uh, their candidates than it would be here in Spain. And we also found that given this kind of bureaucratic mentality, it's, a more, it's more of the, the, even if they're using the Internet and trying to reach out to people, it seems that this is not seen as authentic, or at least it has not changed the ways in which they, they interact with the people. They haven't found a way to, uh, at least amongst the major parties, to more effectively contact the people in this way. And that's why we see negative relationships in terms of party identification with the, the PSOE and the PP in Spain, uh, whereas we don't see uh, much of a relationship at all in the American case. Uh, and finally, uh, we see, uh, though, on the other hand, there seems to be some of a, of a structural shaping of the Internet in terms of the political culture of participation. That is, uh, we find that uh, people who are heavy Internet users, and uh, particularly with respect to uh, age and income uh, and education status, we find there's strong support for, in the Web 2.0 case, in both the U.S. and in Spain, that there are a lot of similarities between these people, that independent of age, income, and uh, 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 education levels, or to a certain extent, um, negatively so, uh, in the Spanish case with respect to age, that these people are participating uh, on online uh, in a Web 2.0 format, whereas they're not participating in Web 1.0 format, which suggests the structure of the Internet forum and the structure of participation is an important area where new things may be happening. And with that, uh, leave things and uh, open the, the floor to, to more general questions. <coughs>